This is Crispin Freeman, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-1-2. Hello, team. Welcome to Comic Commentary, tie-in issues 12 and 13. In this series, we'll be reviewing the Young Justice tie-in comics that folded directly into the story arcs of the animated series. My name's Rich, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Emily. Hey, everybody. In Comics Commentary, we will be discussing how the tie-in comics relate to the video game, the first two seasons of Young Justice, and the broader DC universe. Unlike our regular review episodes, we won't be having a Crashing the Mode segment, so consider this your spoiler warning. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website, crashingthemode.com, on the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it back to Emily for... Hello, Megan! This episode, we are covering issues 12 and 13, entitled The Pendulum and The Penalty. The issue release date was January 18th and February 12th of 2012, respectively. Uh, The timestamps in universe were August 25th and 27th, and then we flash back to February 28th earlier that year and August 27th. Of the previous year, the time stance are weird (laughs) this time around. Uh, And then the episode tie-in is that this episode, that this issue, not this episode, takes place just before downtime, and one scene actually ends up being one minute before downtime starts. The writer for this issue, I almost said episode, uh, is Greg Weissman. (laughs) Yeah. The penciler was Luciano Vecchio, hope I pronounced that right, for issue 12, and friend of the show, Christopher Jones, issue 13. The inker was Luciano Vecchio for issue 12 as well, and Dan Davis for issue 13. Colors, uh, again, by Zach Atkinson, and the letterer continues to be Desi Santi. Just in time for your next mission. So the establishing shot for this issue is that we start in the Gotham City sewers, where the entire team, minus Artemis, is on the hunt for Clayface. Calder is currently distracted by thoughts of Tula and Atlantis, but still takes us to a flashback of a few hours earlier where Batman assigned them the tracking mission while he works on finding a way to neutralize Clayface. Uh, From there, Robin's train of thought takes us to an even earlier flashback. (laughs) So many flashbacks. Of Clayface (laughs) being delivered in a barrel to the Wayne Foundation building. There, he attacks Bruce, Dick, and Lucius Fox, but even after quick-changing into their super suits and using all of their bat tech, Clayface still takes them all down and escapes into the sewers. Uh, Clayface then takes us to another flashback of when he first emerged from the Lazarus pit the night before. He seems dazed and confused, but Talia and Sensei both recognize him as Matthew Hagen. Sensei seems to blame Talia for the existence of this mud creature and tries unsuccessfully to kill him. Rachel Ghoul then in- intervenes and he identifies Clayface as a member of the League of Shadows and uses his control over the shadows to put Clayface to sleep, at least temporarily, and makes plans to send the creature to Batman in Gotham City. Rachel Ghoul then asks his daughter Talia how this all happened, which leads us to our next flashback. <laughs> We cut to months earlier where Talia is seeking her father's approval of her relationship with Matthew Hagen, a low-level member of the League of Shadows. It's implied that Raish would prefer her to date Batman, but Talia claims that will never happen. She wants to be with Matt Hagen because he likes her for her and sees her as something more than just the daughter of Raish al Ghul. Raish finally gives her his blessing to be with Matt, but warns her to be careful with him. It's all surprisingly sweet for, like... A conversation between supervillains. Like, honestly, honestly. It's actually really, yeah. yeah. He's a horrible supervillain who wants to destroy humanity, but he's not a horrible father. He's trying his best to understand his daughter's love life. Sure he is. Sure, maybe, kind of. He's attempting. 
Okay, but then uh, Talia then meets up with her secret assassin boyfriend by a waterfall, as one does. They kiss and they celebrate, and everything seems great until Matthew reveals that he only has six months left to live because he's dying of cancer, and only the Lazarus Pit can cure him. Yep, that's a bombshell that we drop in this issue. Burying uh, the lead there, Matthew. Yeah. Yay, <laughs> we can we can be together, except I'm dying. Yay. Yay. Thanks for having this really awkward conversation with your dad. <laughs> yeah. Oh. She then tells him that only her father can use the Lazarus Pit and that he would make no exceptions for anyone but Matthew insists that she has access to the pit and no one would stop her because she's Talia al Ghul. Talia finally agrees, but she she doesn't look too happy about it. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, when the main thing about I want to date this boy because he does not see me as your daughter and the one thing he says to you in this conversation <laughs> is you are your father's daughter, right. you're like, oh, so wah, that's wah. how it is. <laughs> Drop the ball there, Matthew. Talia leads Matthew, reluctantly, to the Lazarus pit, tells him to submerge himself in it, and then she closes and locks the pit, trapping him inside because, and I'll say it, she's Rachel Ghoul's daughter. Yeah. <laughs> she admits it. She did. She walks away crying, and her mind flashes back to the year before this murder, where she's... <laughs> <laughs> Where she kisses back. He didn't die, but it's still... Murder makes me think of my ex-boyfriend. You know, it's you know. just how it goes. <laughs> right. Where she's kissing Batman next to the bat signal in Gotham City. She, there are locations here. Waterfall, bat signal. <laughs> there, Batman tells her that as long as she continues working with her father, they can't be together and walks away. Hashtag bat breakup. It's truly tragic. Does he keep does he keep that on his utility belt? Is it like a like it's a spray a, a, that he uses? <laughs> the bat breakup? It's like a really it's a really sad card that's like it's not <laughs> it's me. Pulls it out of a pocket. It's got a little it sad people, bat away. on it. It's got yeah. a sad yes. yes. bat emoji. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Batman leaps into the twenty first century. <laughs> We're a very professional podcast. <laughs> Oh, we then cut back to the present time, uh, exactly one year post Batman Talia breakup, where the team is suddenly attacked by Clayface in the Gotham City sewers. A fight ensues, but Clayface eventually takes everyone down and escapes. Uh, we then cut over to what Artemis has been doing this whole time. She's in police custody in Star City. Uh, there she runs into High School Junior. And it turns out that the two of them were actually childhood friends, and they wind up talking for a bit on a police station bench. We then cut to Artemis standing on a rooftop with Green Arrow later that day, telling him what she learned from that conversation. And it turns out that the League actually sent her in undercover to gather intel that will lead directly to the prison break mission in Terrors, a little ways down the line. Green Arrow tells her that she did good work, but Artemis makes it very clear that she will never be doing this again. We then cut back to Gotham City, where the team decides to split up to search for Clayface. Meanwhile, Batman is hard at work in the Batcave trying to find a way to subdue Clayface, trusting Aqualad to not let the team engage the creature without backup. Uh, meanwhile, the team engages the creature without backup. Clayface tricks each team member into letting their guard down. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just laughing at Wally. <clears throat> and takes them out one by one. <laughs> Calder's the last one taken out, and just uh, when all hope seems lost, Batman swoops in to save the day in a scene straight out of the beginning of Downtime. We end the issue with the next scene from Downtime, with Batman giving Aqualad an ultimatum. Either commit to leading the team, or walk away. There's actually a lot going on in this episode, besides all the Inception. Like, well, including the Inception. Issue? Did I say episode? You said episode. <laughs> Yeah, probably. That that tracks. This arc, this couple issue arc. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. No, absolutely. Let's dive in. There's there's a lot to like though, and some really bizarre Easter eggs. Yeah. Should we get yeah. to that one? Some deep cuts. Yeah, let's do it. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. 
So as as Rich pointed out, and I pointed out in all of my outline writing, there are so many <laughs> flashbacks in this. Flashbacks and it's, flashbacks and flashbacks. And I I forgot that when I was first rereading it yeah. to take notes on it. So my first my first note in my other notes document says like, is this a flashback in a flashback? And then as we go on, my notes just continually say, oh, God, another flashback <laughs> until I got to the end. I was like, this entire thing is told in flashbacks within flashbacks. That's a lot. It's and on some level, it's super clever. And on some level, it's like, oh, God, this is so complicated. Why are we doing this? Right, right. But I think overall, it works. It works. It's an interesting way of doing this, an interesting way of connecting things. The the thing that got interesting was how much math you had to do. <laughs> to <laughs> Emily did a deep dive into the time travel aspects of this episode just so we could figure out if Damien was somehow conceived during this issue. Because this was, this was something we talked about earlier, and we're wondering, if we are including Batman and Talia in this arc, are we leading up to some reveal down the line somewhere in the series that Damian Wayne exists, their right. child, for people who don't know. They have a son in most comics continuity. And then I went and did math. Uh, <laughs> I, did, I did math for you, Rich. I did math. <laughs> It seemed to imply, there seemed to be in their language some implication that perhaps something had happened. But then as, as I was going to say we, we slash you, I was like just checking your math. You like, you figured it out. Like there's no way, there's actually no way, there's no way. There's, there is no way logically that Damien could exist at this point because of the timeline and because there's only... Six months between things that would mean there is there is no way that Talia could be pregnant during or right after this arc. Right. She and Batman were making out on the rooftop. <laughs> then he As was one does. And he he used the hashtag bat breakup spray and then gave her the card. And then six months after that <laughs> six months after that, she was having the conversation. Is that that's what you calculated, right? Six months after that? Yes, it's six it's six months between the Batman and Talia kiss and her locking Matthew up. And six months is not enough time for a kid to happen. And even if we went by the assumption of saying, well, maybe she was pregnant before the scene with her and Batman on the rooftop, which you could assume, then Rachel Ghoul would have presumably mentioned that she should be dating Batman because you have a kid together. Yeah. Or at least brought Damien up in a conversation. Yeah. It's, it, it, he didn't, it, they don't have to. Like, I could probably push to suspend my disbelief that they didn't bring up Damien in that conversation. But you're absolutely, you brought that up with me. And I was like, you know what? You're right. It's, it's a little weird. Rachel Gould does not seem like the kind of person who would have that card and not play <laughs> <Right>. it. <laughs> just tiptoe around that. Yeah. I've, and, and also just because the Young Justice timeline is so tight and that right, has such exactly. a strict continuity right. that I would not be like, oh, this is an error that I that they would retcon. Like Young Justice doesn't retcon things like that. Yeah. No. Uh <laughs> so while I'm sure, I'm pretty sure, I'm like 75% sure Damien will show up eventually in Young Justice if it continues on long enough. I don't think that during the season one timeline Damien existed at all I could conceivably believe that he existed in invasion somewhere in the background maybe not even to Batman's knowledge but Mm -hmm. I don't think he was born in season one or pre-season one (laughs) yeah I think we're I think we're on the same page now about that it made me think like I mean Greg Weissman wrote this particular issue and when you're dealing with this storyline, which is such a classic storyline and one that's dominated the current DC animated universe movies and that kind of stuff, and Damien being so popular, I'm like, okay, Greg and only Greg wrote this. So, and it's really complicated and has a lot of flashbacks and there's a lot of timestamps. And I'm just like, he had to have done some math here. Yeah. So if he's showing us this relationship, is it set up for later? And maybe there's some stuff in stuff in here that we might hear about in flashbacks in season three yeah. or four or, you know, I don't know, something, something, yeah. Especially because also with like Cheshire and Red Arrow, 
he figured out the timeline of their relationship, even though it doesn't appear in the show and only kind of appears in the video game. Mm -hmm. But he still worked out the entire timeline of their relationship to get to the point that it makes sense for them to have a kid that is Leon's age by season two. So, like, yeah. if you're going to bother with that when we don't see any of that yeah. in comics and only in the video game in the background, why would you not put in the work for something that is more central to a comic book arc? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Anyway, well, that was that complicated conversation. <laughs> Aside from that Talia al Ghul related math, there's a bunch right. of... there's. <laughs> One of the one of the tiny little things in this in this issue in this arc that made me smile is that we get another Robinism that isn't in the show, that's using the word shevelled as the opposite of disheveled, and it makes me laugh whenever we get a different word from Robin <laughs> right. that we didn't see on the show. It's just cute. It's adorable. It's Robin. I approve and wanted to point it out. <laughs> yeah, I agree. But looping back around to Talia again, kind of. I, reading this, had questions about what is, what is Rachel Ghoul's mind control powers? How does right. this work? I feel like I am missing something really big in this issue because he walks into a room and it's just like, go to sleep, Matthew. I'm like, what? You can just do this? <laughs> right. What are the extent of this? Right. I, need, I need answers. I hear you. And, and the way that I read it, what I think is happening is that all of the League of Shadows members all have subliminal suggestions planted into their head. So that they can't do stuff like they can't turn on Raish or Sensei or anyone else, right? And also that he can probably give them some simple, like shut them down. Basically, it's his his equivalent of Red Sun, right? I don't think he can make them do crazy stuff, whatever he wants. I think that he can say like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, have a seat. You know, let's talk this out. Put the weapon down. That kind of stuff. Uh, you know, super, or super mur villain timeout, murder that guy, whatever, you know, handy day to day thing you need. But other than that, that's what I think is happening, because I mean, Raish, though. So here's the thing, like, this is my impression of, of Raish, and I haven't done a, a recent deep dive on him, but he he's a geomancer. So the, the shtick with him is that he's basically a master of feng shui. And understands ley lines that happen that, that are crossing the earth. So he has knowledge of magic. That's how he recognizes the charm that Artemis is wearing in season two as a magical object and pulls it off of her. But he's never shown as like, he's not like Doctor Strange or something, right? He's not like Doctor Fate or Zatanna. He doesn't cast spells necessarily, but he's been alive for a long time, centuries. And he, he understands how magic works, could probably perform some things. It's likely that's how the Lazarus Pit works, is that it's in the comics, if I remember correctly from my old school reading, there are multiple Lazarus Pits, and they're all stationed over ley-lined connection points around the Earth. So if one of them got blown up, he still has other ones that he can use, but it, it, he's more like an, almost like an alchemist than he is like a spellcaster. So I don't see him having like mind control powers over people, but I do absolutely see him being like, oh yeah, you're in the League of Shadows here. We're going to do this ritual. And by the way, in this ritual, I'm going to be able to snap my fingers and you'll go to sleep or cluck like a chicken or whatever. <laughs> yes, that makes that makes sense to me. I just don't have all of the information. No. Turn, turn to you for some answers. Well, I don't know if I had any... Answer. I have theory. I have I have hypotheses. You have theories. <laughs> yes. You have theories that make enough sense. Right. Which leads me to my next question uh -oh. for Rich and all of his history knowledge, is that in this in this issue, when talking to Matthew about using the Lazarus Pit to cure cancer, because apparently that's a thing it can do. Sure. She mentions that after what happened to her mother, Rachel Ghoul would make no exception, even if her life was at stake. For anyone else using the Lazarus Pit. And I'm like, I have so many questions now <laughs> right. about Talia's mom because I never even considered Talia having a mom. Like, right. it just didn't cross my mind, even though, you know, it should have. It just didn't. Yeah. I'm like, okay, now, now I want to know what is up with Talia's mom. Do you know, Rich? I, there's a couple of theory, there's a couple of story arcs. Like with everything in comics, it's um, different versions, right? So which one is canon is the, I, I don't know what the current New 52, you know, rebirth yeah. story is, but there's either one 
that Melisande, or Melisande, Melisande is how I pronounce it, uh, Raish's wife at the time, the mother of Talia, they had adopted a child, basically had a foster son named Quinlan. And he was, you know, not allowed in where the Lazarus pit was and some other stuff. But at some point, Melisande found him in there. He ran away. He ran into her. She fell into the Lazarus pit and she died. But that's kind of a really, I think that's more like back, way back from the 70s. But when they wrote um, the story, Batman, Son of the Demon, which is where we get the actual, you know, conception of Damien from back in the 80s, I, I think they tweaked that around. So... Because in that story, in Son of the Demon, Batman and Raish are actually both chasing the same guy, who's a rogue warlord named Kane. It's spelled Q-Y-A-N, but pronounced like Kane, this alternate <laughs> spelling for Cain and Abel, who had gotten into uh, Raish's castle and had murdered Melisanda by throwing her in the Lazarus pit. And since these Lazarus pits, it's weird. I don't know how they're going to do this. So... I've always understood that the Lazarus Pit will technically work for other people, and that's been used in story arcs in Batman the Animated Series and in Batman Beyond. In Batman Beyond, they had this whole shtick. Oh, God, it was a heartbreaking, bizarre episode where the 90 or 80 or 90-year-old Bruce Wayne turns around and Talia, who is still young, is in his, in his house, and she's offering him a dip in the Lazarus Pit to, you know, become young again. Ugh. That whole episode was crazy. And it's happened in Under the Red Hood. So here's a bit of a spoiler for some other things, guys. Uh, that the dead Robin we've talked about that's in the grotto is named Jason Todd. He's never mentioned <laughs> in he's, he's mentioned he's never mentioned in, in um Young Justice. By name anyway, right? Yeah. Don't die. That's that's the reference. <laughs> Judd Winnick, a, a fantastic writer, um, Judd Winnick was given the many years ago now seems so fresh in my mind, but it was so long ago, was tasked with the idea or he was he offered the idea up of let's revive Jason Todd. And the story was that Raish had hired Joker as basically a distraction for some other things that he was doing. And that's when Joker got a hold of Jason Todd, basically beat him into near death with a crowbar and blew him up in a warehouse. So that's how Jason died. When Raish found out that's what happened, which had never been his intent, he collected Jason's body and tried to bring him back to life with the Lazarus Pit. It went left pretty bad. So Jason kind of went it. crazy. He basically went insane from the Lazarus Pit because he, he had actually been fully dead and basically ran off. So um, then Jason came back, and whether he's still the full Jason that we used to know, and he just has always been this crazy, or whether the Lazarus Pit kind of turned his issues up to 11, we don't know. My point is, is that in, as plot devices, the Lazarus Pit has worked on other people before. So this thing it's, that where Melisanda dies going into the Lazarus Pit is weird, and this thing that, that Matthew gets trapped in it, and I don't know, maybe it's his cancer? I don't know, but he comes out of the Lazarus pit and he's shape changing into different people in that scene in the previous issue, which yeah. is interesting to me. Oh, I assumed you can you are having a revelation and can tell me in one second. I assumed that the reason part of Matthew's reaction, adverse reaction to the Lazarus pit is that he is trapped in there for too long uh, of some sort of thing of like you're not supposed to stay in the Lazarus pit for an extended amount of time like. I can see that making sense because she does lock him in. Like she could just have left him, but no, she locks him into this bathtub of death and walks away. Well, I hear you, but I mean, Melisanda died, and she hadn't. She just died. Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't understand that. And she hadn't been in there, so maybe, maybe he, maybe, maybe he died because he was dead. But they pulled Melisanda out. And then she was dead, but he died and then came back because the Lazarus pit resurrected him. And then he died again and then resurrected and died and he just couldn't get out. And that was the thing that was happening. But he trans. I'd have to go back and look at the issue and, and maybe our listeners can, can go back and look at it too. What, what's interesting to me is that he comes out and it looks like he's shape changing into some specific people that we haven't seen before. And one of them is a woman. And I'm wondering if that's Talia's mom. I'm wondering if her genetic material is somehow in the Lazarus pit and Clayface is shape-changing into her mom for a second. That's a very 
very interesting theory, but and I don't have the comic on hand. It is away at this moment, but I think that's actually Talia. So he's he's seeing Talia and like subconsciously yeah. shape changing into her. Hmm, interesting. Because I, if I'm remembering it correctly, it's Rachel Ghoul and then Talia. Okay, is who he shape changes into. I might be totally wrong and remembering it incorrectly, but that is my memory of it. Because when I when I when I saw it it being Raish, which I think you're right, I think it is Raish. I was like, oh, it's Raish and some other woman. So the genetic material of Raish and the genetic material of Melisanda are in there, and that's kind of feeding into what he's shifting into. That's what I was. I don't know. Maybe it's just a, another hypothesis. That's cool, and I like it as a theory. That's my head canon right now. <laughs> until it gets correct. I am. I am so much more familiar with the way that they used the Lazarus pit on Arrow, which was just, whoops, we killed off the wrong person. Let's right. bring them back <laughs> consistently, at least once a season. Whoops. Actually, speaking of that, that's that's something else that I, I just realized not very long ago is they didn't bring Talia into Arrow, at least in when I last time yes, I watched they it. They did? Oh, okay. Cool. I can... Check real quick, but if I'm remembering correctly... No, no, there was a daughter, but it wasn't Talia. Oh, okay. So, and that was my thing. Like, I was like, oh, they didn't bring Talia in. I wonder if there was, like, copyright issues or, like, they were using her for something. or Because they always do that weird stuff where it's like, we can't have the same character. Google says that she apparently eventually showed up later down the line after both of us stopped watching. And oh, is, perfect. Uh, well, and that's okay. It's the just that the original sister of uh, Nessa. <clears throat> right. Her. So I was looking at Nessa and I was like, oh, they just added some random person. I don't yeah, know who this same. is. But, <laughs> same. But that's thoughts. not, but that, that isn't who it was. Nessa was actually Rachel Gould's daughter in the comics as well, but from a previous marriage. And she, yeah, which I didn't know until just recently. So that's actually, that's actually super cool. Uh, I like that they did that. Quick Google search reveals that eventually, so many seasons down the line, they eventually brought in Talia and did exactly that. Oh, cool. And speaking of Talia, back in the actual comic that we're talking about, not Arrow, that neither of us watch anymore. Talia is so cold in these issues, and it's kind of incredible, and I kind of love it, and I'm also kind of terrified of her. Yeah. Uh, Like that moment where she slams the lid and locks him in, I'm like, Oh, dang, girl, that is cold. But at the same time, I'm like, he kind of deserves it. Not really, like, not really, but like emotionally, I understand where she's coming from. (laughs) But I also, I love with that scene and with the scene of them in the forest that there's this ambiguity about whether he actually genuinely really cares about her and just screwed up and said the wrong thing and she reacted badly right or if he's been manipulating her the whole time from the beginning of their relationship because like is i can enough. read it both ways mm-hmm. and i think that that's a really interesting way that it's written of whether or not you go oh wow he's such a jerk and he's been playing with her emotions this entire time and she reacts the way a murderous assassin would react to that right or if he's just the unwitting assassin boyfriend who just didn't realize how much it meant to her to be seen and liked for who she really is right so i think it's left up to interpretation and i think that's just really interesting that the way that they do that and also there i i do like that there is a bit of a reminder of like okay i mean she because this is a very sweet conversation with her dad and like yep all the stuff going on, you're just really kind of like really made to be sympathetic with Talia. And yeah. oh yeah, by the way, remember this reason why Batman gave her the hashtag Bat breakup card was yeah. because she's like a murderer. Yup, yup. Uh, that's generally generally a deal breaker on most relationships. He's all, I'm afraid that I would say the wrong thing and be closed in the Lazarus pit. This can't work. Yeah, it's Batman. That's uh, yeah, not an unreasonable well, argument not there, Batman. An unreasonable argument. <laughs> But going to other relationships in this, it amuses we it amuses me way too much that they include Kid Flash more than once asking where Artemis is and right. pretending that he's I noticed like that as well. Just annoyed that he's just annoyed that like, oh, she doesn't have to come on the sewer mission. Where is she? How's she wasting her time? And I'm like, sure, sure. This is this is post uh post the episode with Kent Nelson. So like, nah, you're you're a little bit in denial already, boy. That's yeah. that's not the only reason you're asking this question. <laughs> and it amuses me way too much. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Just in denial. Says Kid, says Kid Flash. 
which leads right. us to where Artemis is this whole issue, which has many right. interesting things going on. And one of them is that I get to do a mini super sweet arts real quick for I a non this. This for a fantastic. non-canon ship on the show, which is <laughs> Frostbite, which people well versed in Young Justice ships will know as uh Artemis and Ice School Jr. is a little 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 ship that some people have. Uh and in the classic main DC continuity where Artemis Croc is a villain and is generally known as Tigress and all of that. She and Ice School Jr. had an on-again, off-again relationship and eventually had a daughter named Isabel in classic comics continuity that got changed a bit around during uh, the New 52 and everything. But way back in an alternate history for the DC Universe, they are a couple and have a kid together. So I just love that they have this little nod to that of them having this little interaction as as awkward teenagers. And I also continue to love the implication that Artemis has all of these weird old friends from the family business that she hasn't talked to in forever. And like we we talked about this in a previous thing of her recognizing somebody as, oh, he he used to work with my dad, which is the most casual way of saying <laughs> that guy's a super villain and I know right. him. He works with my dad. It was the white rabbit yeah. rabbit hole thing where Artemis Professor is like, Ivo. oh, Professor Ivo. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. I think we both said we want more of that. I want so much more of this in season three. And since going by the art for season three that they've released of them doing some undercover stuff, I can, I can cross my fingers and hope that they're going to run into villains and she's just going to be like, yeah, you were at the Christmas party five years ago. Um, <laughs> can we can we like have a deal Awkward. here or something? Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And even though I don't ship it, I think the interaction between her and Cameron is really funny because he is trying to hit on her, and she's just like, "Dude, no, dude, no." I've no. <laughs> we were we knew each other as kids. This is weird. Stop right now, and it's hilarious to me. Right. And that is immediately followed by her conversation with Green Arrow on the rooftop, where. She very casually mentions when talking about this, about talking about high school junior tells her that she should be tried as an adult so she can go to Bell Rev and she can break out with them later. It's implied because we're setting up all of that. And Artemis mentions that with her record and pedigree, she'd end up in Bell Rev, which implies to me that Artemis has been arrested before. And yeah. I want that story. Yeah, she says record. She didn't say just pedigree. Yeah, like just being like, oh, because of my parents. She says, no, because of my record. I'm like, yeah. Artemis has a criminal record and I want to know why. Because we've implied yeah. that Artemis has done some not fully legal things considering she wakes up in a desert with no memories and immediately believes she has to kill a sidekick without any question about it. So there's an implication that Artemis has killed people before <laughs> with out hesitation but this also yeah. implies that she's been caught and i want this story so bad i want the yeah. story of like artemis's weird screwed up preteen criminal record i like to i like to think that like maybe her dad was setting her up for the kill but not like making her a kill when she was like nine like she she'd been like you know what i mean like the implications of that <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I like to hope that Artemis hasn't killed anyone, but if somebody said Artemis had, I'd believe it. But if she had a, if she has a record, did she steal stuff? Was she in a costume? Like, was she, was she a supervillain with her dad? Like, did she go on some kind of thing with her dad? Now I'm just imagining like a 12 year old supervillain of Artemis. You know what I'm imagining is Kick Girl from. <laughs> Right? Oh, Hit Girl with the purple and all of that. Yeah. Is it? Oh, Hit Girl. That's hit what girl. it is. Hit Girl. Hit yeah. Girl, Kick Girl, same thing. Yeah, no. But, like, I think that would be fascinating. I want more of that. Every, every like, small detail about Artemis's childhood, it just has me being like, wow, that's screwed up. Tell me more. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. But then we also have the everybody splitting up to track down Clayface, which should this not be a funny scene. But it is just because yeah. of how easily he tricks every single one of them and how he does it. Because there's me being me who's like, he tricks both Superboy and Miss Martian using Super Martian things and it amuses me to no end. It's just Superboy being concerned about his future girlfriend and him complimenting Miss Martian and then immediately punching her in the face. <laughs> and I'm like, that's hilarious. But it is then immediately followed up by 
Kid Flash almost making out with Clayface in an abandoned warehouse. And I can't believe that this is something that happened. It's something that happened. Just, yeah. I don't think anybody else saw it or it would have come up in the show. Yeah. I'm like, if anyone else had seen this, no one is letting Kid Flash live this down. Yeah. Because cause honestly, <laughs> during some later episode where Wally was being super like squidgy, somebody could just walk by and just go, what's Clayface. up, Clayface? Yeah. It just... <laughs> Clayface, <laughs> just have him like shut down. Hey, again, and Robin just walks by and is like, "Remember that time you almost kissed Clayface?" Bye. Yeah, or just throw just throw some mud at Wally. Oh yes, uh, but yeah. all of which leads us to final note here. Uh, with the this issue perfectly bleeds into downtime. Literally, the scene where they are all lying knocked out on the ground before Batman comes in is labeled as the timestamp is one minute before the opening timestamp of downtime. Yeah. Because the internet tells me fun facts like this, but all of that leads into the other important scene at the beginning of downtime. That is Batman's ultimatum speech to Aqualad about how he can't split his, he can split his time between Atlantis and the surface world, but he can't split his mind and he has to either focus on the job and get the job done or walk away to be with whoever is living outside of the hero life that his mind is focused on. And all of that holds a lot of weight just because Batman, Bruce Wayne, we all know this, but it holds even more weight because of Talia's inclusion in this arc and the heavy emphasis on Talia and Bruce's relationship with her adds so much more to that conversation and so much more. This is something I just, I didn't catch it. Yeah. I didn't catch it the first time I read it. I caught it this time. <laughs> yeah, I didn't catch it until I read you. You put it in the outline. I was like, "Oh yes, thank you." I love stuff like that. It's yeah. so great. I I love when they're able to add so much more meaning to a line that already held a ton of meaning. It wasn't a meaningless line beforehand, but including the fact that Batman breaks up with Talia and walks away from Talia because she can't walk away from the life that he can't be a part of. So he has to walk away from her. He's like, I can't have you and be a hero. Yeah, absolutely. And she said, and and she says that too. She says like, she can't, he can't look at, he can't, she can't, he can't look at me without thinking that, you know, I'm Rachel Ghoul's daughter and he can't, he has his crusade and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely spot on. And she has the exact same thing where she says, I can't believe you're asking me to choose between you and my dad. And he's like, the fact that you see that as a choice is exactly why this can't work. Right, exactly. Yeah, and it's just it's fantastic. I love I love that. There's a, there's a bunch of like little like the the, throw, the throwback to um, Icicle Junior and Artemis's relationship in the comics is really interesting because that's a deep cut, man. That's a deep deep cut. Yeah, and they never. I was about to say they never interact on the show. They do. They do in season two for when she's working with Aqualad for a little bit. But we never see them talk to each other. He doesn't know it's her. Yeah, but he doesn't know who her, right? Exactly. And I would have, yeah. I would have, I would have paid so much money to have them like run into each other on the show right. and just have that awkwardness. Like, oh, that would have been perfect. Yeah, and they, you know, and then they're they're talking about like Talia's mom and that kind of stuff. Like, these aren't really like common things. Like, yeah. they're really digging deep. But one of the things that I found really interesting. Was McGann has a throwaway line where she just says, fighting Clayface is like fighting a, a, a rabid Ma'alafa'ak on Mars. And they're like, what's a Ma'alafa'ak? And I'm just like, I, I like slapped my face. I was like, really? Like, I, so she's implying that a Ma'alafa'ak is a, is a shape-changing animal of some sort on Mars, right? Yeah. But in the comics, Ma'alafa'ak is John Jones's brother. That's his name, Ma'ala Fa'ak Jones. Such a long name. Oh, God. Also, so in the Justice League animated series, the Green Martian genocide was instigated by uh, white Mar- these white Martian shape-changing things going on, right? But in the comics, the genocide was caused by Ma'ala Fa'ak. So he had ba- he basically caused an extinction-level event on Mars— by instigating something called Hieronymir's Plague. So basically, any Martian, after he initiated this thing, any Martian who used their telepathic abilities would burn to death and die. That's so, a lot. yeah. 
so the only survivors were Ma'ala Fa'ak and, and John Jones, because in the comics, John had been kind of like Adam Strange. He had been accidentally teleported through space and time to Earth from Mars, and making him like the only survivor at the time. But there's a bunch of other like weird implications, like Malfoc and, and, and John were brothers, and so they went through this ceremony where a piece of each of their personalities got put into each of their minds, which is the same thing that happens with your kids, and same thing happens with your, you know, your spouse. And so it's one of those things where you're like literally sharing, like literally sharing a part of yourself, right, with someone else. And so there's this implication that that Malafaak was immune to this plague, therefore John was immune to the plague, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see, he doesn't show up very often in animated series stuff, but you can see him in uh, one, if I remember correctly, he's one of Caleb's favorite uh, Justice League uh, animated movies, just the uh, Doom, Justice League Doom. Because when they recruit Bane and they recruit Cheetah and they're recruiting all these villains for the main Justice League ca- uh, characters, but Malafaak, they recruit to do some terrible things to John yeah. in that movie. Um, so you can check it out and see who Mala Fawak is. But the, the fact that she mentions that, um, that this is actually some kind of shape changing monster on Mars makes me wonder, like, is he going to show up? And he took on that name as like his supervillain name because it's a shape changing monster on Mars. That's, that's interesting. Or are they, are they just implying that he's not real? <laughs> like, like John, John doesn't have a brother yeah. named Mala Fawak and it, um, Mala Fawak is just a thing. I, I don't. I'm not sure what they're going to do with that. But that was a really, again, that was a deep cut. That was yeah, a deep it was a deep cut. cut right little bizarre. Like we're going to throw this in here. I'm like, wait, what? What? Because I mean, that's an unusual name. That one jumped out at me. It was like the Exionizer Blade, where I was just like, <laughs> yeah, that's not a. You didn't just make that up on the spot and throw that in there. Like this is, you know, this is a thing. So I'm interested to see how that goes. I had a I had a note about that line, so I'm glad you were able to explain it. Cause and it really amuses me with that of she says that and everyone else in the group is willing to just let it pass as Miss Martians just being a weird alien. But Superboy actually goes, Wait, what is that? And they never right. get an answer, but I really appreciate that they call it out there. But here's the deal. Saying saying Ma'alafa'ak is is not easy. I can say Ma'alafa'ak now better than I can say War World without <laughs> thinking about it. But Superboy, it, it's, it's weird. It. It's, it's written mispronounced. It's, right, right. I'm like, I love it. I love that you figured out a way to write out a word to tell me that it's being mispronounced. <laughs> right, exactly. You take out all the apostrophes and all the double uh, vowels. <laughs> right. There's a lot of both. Exactly. And that's badly uh, said, Martian. <laughs> All right, let's dive into artistic license. Let's go. Have all four sidekicks ever been in the same place at the same time? Don't call us sidekicks. In artistic license, we'll be recommending individual issues, miniseries, and graphic novels, uh, both from DC and other companies who have titles we think Young Justice fans will enjoy. Artistic license is designed to give you an on-ramp into the classic story arcs of the past, so you might catch a glimpse of what's to come in the future. And this week was an easy one. (laughs) It's Batman, Son of the Demon. Batman Son of the Demon was the 1987 graphic novel written by Mike Barr uh, with artist Jerry Bingham. And it basically leads into everything that happens in this issue, everything that happens in, you know, the the Son of Batman animated movie, just all the Damien stuff. So in the story, as I mentioned earlier, Raish and Batman are working together to track down the guy who murdered Raish's wife, Melisanda, who is this rogue warlord assassin. So during the story, uh, even though like Batman and Talia have had this on again, off again romance um, for a while, they don't have any kind of chance to follow through with any of this, right? So after, if I remember correctly, they find the assassin. Um, uh, Batman ends up spending a lot of time at the castle, uh, and that relationship comes to fruition, right? So they end up getting married, uh, <laughs> even though it's in this weird end around having to do with something about an ancient tradition where only the woman needs to say that she wants to get married. And then the ceremony happens without the guy knowing about it. And suddenly he's married. It's very weird. But anyway, that seems, that seems not right. <laughs> it seems a little odd. Yeah. Anyway. So in the comic, this is where Damien, cause they got, they get married. They actually, he actually spends quite a bit of time there and he had to spoil everything, I guess, but he, <laughs> Batman knows that she's pregnant. He finds out she's pregnant. So he's been there for months and months. So she's pregnant. And, but there's like all, there's a bunch of other stuff that happens and she tells him that she lost the baby. And so he, they, they, they annul the marriage 
I'm assuming only she needs to do that in this weird situation. But um, anyway, so, and he goes back to Gotham and she ends up having the baby. And in the comic, she puts him up, puts Damien up for adoption. So he's not raised by the League of Shadows. But I think in this rewrite later on that they did when they first introduced him, uh, the son of Batman graphic novel that introduced Damien, they said that, you know, she kept him and blah, blah, blah. So that's the story. So um, IGN ranked that particular graphic novel as the number five in the 25 best Batman graphic novels list, best Batman graphic novels of all time. And we'll have a link to the Comixology um, version of that, although you can find the hardbacks and softbacks around as well. Um, We'll put a link to that in the show notes. And that's it. So I think we can wrap up this mission, head out of the Watchtower. The best way to support the show is, of course, to share it with a friend. You can also support us with a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Leaving a rating or review pushes us up in the search ranks and helps other people find the show. Also, please continue to hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology. It's the best way to follow along with us at home. And buy the show somewhere online until the DC streaming service launches, hopefully soon. <laughs> we can also now use hashtag Young Justice Outsiders when talking about season three online. And if you want to help us get more episodes, more secret origins, actual play podcasts, and all of that other stuff that you love, please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us do even more with the show while getting some great rewards for yourself. And as of this recording, at least as of this release of this recording, I should say, you can now find us on YouTube. So, uh, Well, the Young Justice Files is now available on YouTube. All of our previous episodes are either uploaded or being uploaded as I'm recording. You can find us at crashingthemode.com slash YouTube. Uh, there you're going to find uh, individual playlists collecting all of our shows. So you can find all of the individual playlists for Secret Origins, the discussion sessions, Super Sweethearts, Everything we've got uh, coming up and having already been done, you can go and play them in order yeah. if you want. If YouTube is is more your style, which seems yeah. odd if you're already listening to us on a podcatcher, but you know. Well, yeah, I don't know. Gets- it seems like YouTube is 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 the way that people listen to stuff, particularly at work and that kind of stuff. That's yeah. that's what I understand, man. So if we're it's we're what going you where do, the no judgment. We want to go where the people are. Yup. I don't know why I breasted into Mer- Little Mermaid there. Because the next issues are underwater. We're getting hyped for next next issue arc. Sure, that's why. I like that. And, I like that reason. Yeah. And remember, <laughs> stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.